Yes, OK. This is, this is just recording, right? OK. Um, so yes, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a very serious topic. I don't know if the talk is going to be very serious. <laughs> you can sometimes make a little bit of fun with very serious topics. So uh, I, I don't want anyone in the room to feel uh, uncomfortable with the topic. I will talk about politics. I don't know if everyone's familiar with the context of uh, what has been going on those 10 last, year, last years in the, uh, in the Middle East region. But uh, I will try to be as, uh, as informative as possible and clear as possible. Uh, <coughs> my, my, my presentation will be divided in three parts. The first part will, um, will give you a little bit of context about what we do and uh, the research that we are pursuing and why and this is a question that many people always ask me when I go to web science conference. Wh why did we join the web science, uh, the web science research and the web science uh, community to do this kind of research? Why, when most of the people in the web science community are from computer science or from uh, data analytics, why do we have a research team on uh, information warfare and uh, the society of the Middle East? And this is uh, one of the, uh, the first part of my presentation would be about um, why society is so important in web science. And, uh, and why is, uh, this is why web science is so important and so different from other sciences. It's because it, it, it's interdisciplinary. And I will explain to you why this, interdisciplinary, this inter interdisciplinarity is such a chance for, uh, for researchers like you and uh, how you can make the best of it if you, are, if you really want to go into this kind of, uh, of, uh, of discipline. Uh, the second part is going to be, uh, I, I want to introduce you with a, one of the best papers that has ever been written by uh, the web science community. It's called the Manifesto for Web Science. And I will give you a few uh, indications on this interdisciplinarity and uh, why, why it makes sense into the research that we do. What are the, the most important part of this uh, theoretical background that we use in the research that we do? And then in the third part, I will introduce you with what the research that we do. We had four different contexts of research that we, uh, we explored uh, since 2010. And I will show you uh, the results, some of the results of uh, what we do and uh, what we did in, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. So, uh, I couldn't find a better picture than this one. Those people look really disgusting and ugly. Uh, and uh, I don't want you to have this kind of uh, perception of the Middle East. We have nice people, nice uh, uh, men and ladies and everything. So these guys are, I would say, the, not the problem, but some, they illustrate some kind of the problems that we have in the Middle East. And those guys now have, uh, like you guys, have laptops. And they have a cable from the laptop that goes to the internet. And these guys can talk uh, or use uh, their credit cards or use drugs or use any kind of uh, things that everybody in the rest of the world can use to actually wage wars on their people, wage wars between themselves. And uh, so this is a, uh, an illustration of the situation that we have now. But I don't want you to have this image of the Middle East. The Middle East is very, can be very different from that. So, As I said, my, my first, the first part of the presentation would be uh, about explaining how we brought web science to the Middle East because we are the only web science research team, I would say, uh, between uh, maybe Koblenz and uh, South Korea. <laughs> so we have like a very large section of the world just for ourselves. And of course, we are the only web science research team in the Middle East. Uh, I think we have some colleagues uh, as Stefan mentioned, from uh, the Bar Ilan University in uh, in Tel Aviv, and uh, but th these these people we we don't research exactly the same thing. They are like specialists in medicine and uh, and uh, science for uh, for health. So uh, we we don't really collaborate with them. And anyway, even if we would like to collaborate with them, we can't because we're technically uh, not allowed to talk to uh, the people from Israel. So um, the. 
the, the interdisciplinary research unit in web science is the structure that I created in my university, that's our beautiful campus. Uh, and uh, the research uh, unit in web science has been created in, um, in the Faculty of Humanities, which uh, was very important at the, at the beginning because we are people from social science uh, with humanities background. Most of my team are researchers from uh, international relations, history, sociology, anthropology, and we don't have anyone, we don't have people from computer science in the team. So th that's a little bit of a problem for us, but it's also very interesting because we, 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 can, we still can do web science even without the computer science people in the room. So that's, uh, that's uh, you're gonna look at this. So we, we started in 2002, the research team, and um, I don't know if you know the geography of the, of the corner where we are. You see Lebanon is the yellow thing that's between Israel and Syria. We are very nice neighbors. And uh, Lebanon is very small, it's like 6 million people and 3 million refugees. <laughs> Thank you Germany for taking more please. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's the size of Corsica. I don't know if you know the island of Corsica. Or it's, uh, it's uh, a little bit bigger than Luxembourg, I think. So uh, this is very, very small and it's quite mountainous. So this is where we are. And uh, the research team that we had since 2002 was mostly interested in the digital transformation of the Middle East in, the, uh, in, the, in society, how digital uh, was introduced in the Middle Eastern societies. I will, I will go back to this because this makes a lot of sense <coughs> when you think about uh, uh, the transformation power that tools like Facebook or Twitter can have on societies. Uh, I don't know if you, have, uh, if you know about Morozov, maybe you heard about Evgeny Morozov. He wrote something about the, um, the disillusion, the net disillusion, delusions, I think. So uh, the fact that we thought that Facebook would actually change the world, but it didn't. Anyway, that's, that's if you want, don't want to read the book, that's the only thing that you have to remember. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, we were interested in the new paradigms brought by uh, technology, but also you heard about the Arab Spring which is a good marketing word to say uh, how uh, dictators can replace other dictators. And uh, the problem of conflicts, of course, because most of the Arab Spring's transformation turned into conflicts. And in the end, the, uh, uh, the new, I would say not very new, but the problem uh, that the group called ISIS, everybody knows what ISIS is, it's the Islamic State in Iraq and, uh, and Syria, something like that. So you can call them also Daesh or uh, the is Islamic State only. So, uh, but I don't want to call them the Islamic State because it would mean that the Islamic State, they represent the Islamic State. So let's call them the organization called Islamic State. Okay, it's like Prince, you know, the, the former artist known as Prince. Maybe I think this. Um, you know Prince? No? <laughs> so uh, uh, this research team made of social scientists, historians, uh, international relations. We're looking at the society in, uh, in the Middle East and the transformations. And at some point, we got very tired of the old methodology of trying to understand what was going on. We wrote a couple of articles between 2002 and 2010 that were really disappointing in a bit because we were using the old social science you know, from the 50s and the 60s to analyze uh, ch changes and disruption brought by technology. And, uh, it wasn't enough. We were very like taking not very interesting results, and it was very like old style uh, uh, research. So what we decided to do is to look at this paper that was uh, I can't remember the date, maybe 2006 or something yes, like that, yes. uh, called uh, "Science for the Web," the web science uh, called by um, Berners-Lee and Shabolt and uh, Ender and Wendy and all, these, uh, all the team of the Web Science uh, Trust at the time. And the call for a science of the web, um, inside the call there is this, I don't know if, you, if you've seen this before, it's what they call the two magics, okay? So the call was, one of the first sentences like, web science has to be interdisciplinary. Would you can't observe the web if you just keep on one side of the mirror? And the two magics are how a micro application, something that has been built by technicians, by people who have a, a technology at hand, can actually go from a little application that is on the computer, like the World Wide Web, it was, you know, it was brought to you by <coughs> Steve Ernestly on, uh, on this small uh, Next, uh, I think it was one of the only people in the world to have a Next station. <laughs> you know, that's the, the, if you saw the movie about the, the, uh, 
uh, Jobs, uh, you, you will see how the next cube was such a, a failure for <laughs> Apple at the time. But it brought, it brought the web on this small computer, and then it turned out the web is 2 billion people. Facebook, the same. It was a small application of, uh, for a school in Harvard, I think, to put pictures of the girls. And now we have 2 billion people using it. So this complexity from micro adoption, from micro to macro, like my, very small to very big, this was something we couldn't understand with classic sociology. We needed more, we needed new tools to, to do that. And then, of course, the issues that, uh, that uh, were created by those applications, if you think about how people were using Facebook or Twitter during the revolution in Egypt, uh, created a lot of issues. And those issues had to do with values. And I really related to this, to this, uh, to, to this interpretation of the transformation of the web. And creativity goes back to the idea. So the Middle East was at the time exactly following this kind of, of circle, of cycle. Uh, people were adopting technology. The technology would, would like spread out between uh, the, the members of the society. And then at some point, people were trying to create new applications. It's the case of the Ushaidi platform in Kenya and this kind of things exactly express the, the, the two magics of the web. And also the other thing is like, when you, when you go down on the street to ask a few people what they think about the transformation in their society, it's very different than when you can uh, go online and ask uh, 5 million people what they think. Okay, so we had a problem with uh, interpreting the data at the time. So web science is also a mixed method of data analytics and uh, social analysis. And uh, this was very comfortable for us to, uh, to, to, to have this kind of uh, offer at some point. And um, so we were offered by the web science community new tools to, uh, to understand the impact on the, of the web on society. Because for me, web science, this is exactly the science that understands the impact of the web on society. If you don't explain the impact, then you're not doing any web science. Okay? Web science goes uh, the, the extra mile. And this is very important. You have to keep this in mind. Uh, also, web science was moving from power laws, from statistics, from graphs, from uh, anal basic analytics to people. And you can't explain the context. You, ca you will see the context of the information warfare. You can't explain the context if you don't understand the people behind the context and you don't understand the impact on people. So you need to understand the people if you want to understand uh, the, the impact. And this, the concept also of social machines that comes from one of the first articles of Berners-Lee at the time uh, is very interesting. Ushu idea, I've talked about it, is a social machine. The, uh, the, the, the blogosphere is a social machine, and I think that information warfare today uh, works also as a social machine. And, uh, but if I had a PhD to do, this is what I would research, but <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. So uh, now let me talk to you about this great paper that was, that was written by uh, my colleagues Susan Alford, Katie Pope, and Leslie Carr, and presented at the 2000 Web Science Conference in Raleigh. Has anyone in the room ever uh, uh, read or know about this, this paper? Uh, Lindsay, I'm pretty sure. You, you know about it too? Okay. Oh, so yeah. yeah. It's like the Bible, you have to read it. Yes, it's a, it's a very, 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 very good paper. I wish, I, I told Lindsay yesterday, I wish I, I wrote this paper. It's a very interesting <laughs> paper. And uh, this paper is about understanding the web. And uh, understanding the web requires knowledge and expertise from the social and human sciences. When you are a social, uh, social science person and you come from, my background is political science and economy, when you come from those, uh, I would say, non-pure sciences, it's very relaxing and very, you feel very comfortable when you hear those people saying like, to understand the web, you need to go the extra mile after computer science. You just, you just need expertise from these people. So we felt like, oh wow, we have, we have something to do in this, in the, in this uh, web science thing. And, uh, also, the paper says that computer science is just a vantage point. If you look at things on, from the computer science angle, you see different things than when you look at things from the social science angle. That's pretty obvious. But also, it's very interesting. Because most of the sciences now, and even, even till today, are very siloed in their approach of things. And some of you, who's the computer science in the room? All right. Who's more like a social science? All right. So, oh, wow. We have a, it's, a, it's a big proportion compared to what we usually have in conferences. So, uh, of course, computer science is just one point of view. But this is what is most, 
mostly interesting in this, uh, in this paper by, uh, by my colleagues from South Southampton, <laughs> is the fact that, and this is what the, the image uh, illustrates, the co-constitution of technology and society. The web impacts society, so there's a transformation effect that you need to observe, uh, measure, and analyze. But on the other hand, society impacts the web. And this also goes back to the cycle, okay? to the cycle of the two magics. The society, when uh, uh, adopting something, first of all, is transformed by what, uh, the adoption of the thing, of the, of the tool, of the artifact. But it also transforms by adoption. So it's, it's like, it's called, it's called co-constitution. And this comes from the theory of Latour. I don't know if you heard about uh, Bruno Latour. And uh, this is something that is very interesting. Um, another thing that was taken from this paper, that I took from this paper, and that was taken also from Latour, is the concept of actor ne network theory. Who heard about this before? Oh, wow. Uh, so the thing that there's a radical symmetry between human and non-humans. And you will see that in information warfare, the tools that you are using, the computer, the, the networks, and the software, and everything, as, is as important and as integrated into uh, the, the network as the actors, and you will see the actors can be a, a small hacker somewhere in Russia or uh, an organization in, uh, in the United States or a government. And uh, this is very interesting that the, the bureaucrat and the standard agency is just as important as the servers of Google or HTTP in the process of, uh, of the network construction and the impact that, that this construction has in society. Uh, to go over this, there is this, what they call the SCOTE, the social and cultural construction of technology. So uh, this is something that is very interesting. And this is something that um, is even more true now uh, because of adoption has been going all over. When uh, the guy from Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, decides to create Facebook, he's embedding in his creation his values and his culture. And so he's designing something for uh, certain use. Uh, I don't know if the story is true, but they say it's about um, do, doing like some pictures of girls from the class, then decided to do it for the university, then decided to do it for multiple universities. And then in the, in, the, in the growth of Facebook, the values at the beginning, that were at the beginning, the idea, the initial uh, uh, intention of Mark Zuckerberg is still um, printed in the DNA of Facebook. But then you think like, oh, during the, 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 the problems in Egypt and Tunisia, the revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia, people were using Facebook and Twitter to bring down governments. Did, at some point, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, when he designed Facebook from the start, thought that, oh, I will design this to put the pictures of the girls, but also to bring down governments. No. It's, a, it's like some sort of an external effect of this mass adoption. And uh, so the, the, the produce outcomes differ significantly from the original intentions uh, of a given innovation. And this is something that works on the size of adoption. It's a different uh, uh, functionalities if you are like 20,000 people or if you are 2 billion people. So the size is important, but also the context is important. And yesterday I, I had a discussion, I don't know who I was talking to, about the fact that in the Middle East, I think it was Louis Stefan, in the Middle East people see private life differently than people in the US or people in China. And we were discussing with um, that lady from Russia yesterday uh, the fact that those uh, uh, networks, the social networks like Facebook, are not adopted the same way in the US than they are in Russia or China. Because people have different values, people see private life, communication, information, sharing of information differently from uh, a context to another. I don't know if you remember that blogger from, um, from uh, Tunisia, she, deci she decided to go naked online. In the US, going naked online is just your average stuff, like every star on the internet goes naked online. But in Egypt or Tunisia, I, don't, I can't remember, I think it was from Tunisia, going naked online is like, she went to jail, I mean she was... Uh, imprisoned and uh, a family got into a trouble and so uh, the values that that the society has the importation the, the the fact that you bring in a technology that has been designed for another context and you bring it into a different context that has different rules and different values even if when you install facebook or you, you join in facebook you have exactly the same usage rules and the same uh, terms of uh, of usage for the whole world 
it makes a difference according to uh, the place where you are. So this is very interesting, and this is something that I think every social web scientist should have in mind, uh, looking at the things that uh, uh, actually innovations and platforms and this kind of thing. So this is very important. The consequences of this paper for web science, except that when it was presented, there was a huge fight in the room between uh, Tim Berners-Lee, Nigel Shadbolt, and Katy Pope. And Katy Pope was standing on the chair and shouting like this, and everybody was, we were just behind her and clapping. <laughs> it was a big fight, and Berners-Lee got into, a, you know, it was really hard of his mind, because, uh, because the consequences for web science are pretty big. Um, web science is not all of this. Web, sci web science is at, the, is at the intersection of all of this. And uh, it's the genuine intersection of discipline. It's not a sociology, but it's not a computer science. It's something new, it's something different. So that's very important. Uh, another important consequence, web science must look both ways to see how the web is made by humans and how humans are made by the web. So co-constitution co works both ways. And when you do your research, you always have to keep this in mind. Humans have a lot to do with the web. Uh, the actors are very important, the networks implicated in the broader sense, and the effects of these networks. Uh, so, also this is a very important. You can't just stop at some point. You have to go the extra mile. This is why I always say web science is the science of the extra mile. Computer science, analytics, sociology, political science, they go to a certain limit. Web science allows to go the extra mile, both ways. Okay? Uh, it's a critical discipline. The extra mile involves also being critical in what you see. You just can't bring some results and big graphs and nice numbers and say, OK, this is it. You have to go the extra mile. You have to go critical. And to go critical, you, know, you need political so social theory. You need to challenge the web and society that is impacted by the web. And this is why it's called a manifesto. It's really like, uh, like something that gives you the, the, the power to go, uh, to, to go over the, the narrow epistemologies, as they say. Okay, and uh, as in the, the micro and macro phenomena are also very important. You know, now we were discussing yesterday with big data. You know, now we talk about small data and smart data. Okay, because the meaning is in the small. Okay, small is beautiful. Big is interesting, but small is beautiful. Okay, so now how did we import web science in the context of uh, the Arab Near East? I love this picture. It says, Shukran uh, Shab al Masr. Uh, thank you from the people of uh, Egypt. Okay, and they say thank you to Facebook. Uh, we can just spend the rest of the hour discussing about this guy. And what, what, why did this guy did this poster? <laughs> this is very interesting if you think. But, uh, and it's nicely done. You know, there's these two colors, black and red, which is uh, usually colors that has been used for any kind of poster in the Middle East, they do this kind of super design with Arabic and stuff. So it, this, this guy actually took like an hour to, it took him an hour, more than an hour to actually design this kind of, uh, of sign. But it's all over the web, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's famous now. Uh, why did we need to bring in web science into this context of the Arab Near East? First of all, uh, we, we wanted to stop the prescriptive language. We wanted to stop these people coming from the north with their theory and big ideas and uh, perception of the world and import them into the context of the Middle East. Because the, every context is different. You can talk about the web or the usage of the web. It, it was something I hate about some conferences when people start to talk about people. People go on Twitter, people adopt Facebook. What kind of people are you talking about? What are people? Are people, oh yes, we did a study on 500 people from South Southampton. 500 people of South Southampton is not the web. Web is Bangladesh, is Madagascar, is uh, Australia, is Middle East. And th this, this was very really well uh, said by uh, an author called Burris, who said that we create the Lawrence of e Arabia. I love this, the Lawrence of e Arabia. You know Lawrence of Arabia? Okay. And uh, so the Lawrence of e Arabia are the new prescriptive observator, the Orientalists, Orientalists okay? We call that the new Orientalism, and Anderson talked about it. We need to contextualize against the language that comes from the authorities of the North, <laughs> you know, behind the wall. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Uh, and also the myopia, uh, myopia of networks. Large, large networks give the appearance of 
of truth because they are very large. And uh, this is why I was saying small is beautiful. You need to really look into the small stories of every little person everywhere in the world to really understand what the web is about. And uh, th this was very, very true at the time in 2009, 2010. So uh, this is why we needed that. So uh, you, can, you can study the Arab Spring. You can study any kind of context. We decided to look at something that was at the time very pregnant for very present in our everyday life in Lebanon. It's called information warfare. So information warfare, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept. It's, uh, I was just making a joke about you know nothing, Jon Snow. OK, Game of Thrones is not history. It's a, it's a, it's a fiction, right? It never existed, OK? So, uh, but at some point, there is this girl that says to Jon Snow, you know nothing. Because in, in war, in the context of war, information is, I would say, one of the most important weapon and tool that you can use. And information warfare is a lot of things. A lot of things. And the more technology, the more things we, we, we discover of, uh, how to wedge this information warfare. But mostly, it's espionage, it's uh, sabotage, and uh, deception. And you will see that information warfare on the web is just a little bit of this. Because uh, we, didn't, we never got into this kind of uh, computer virus, worms, uh, DDoS attacks, computer IQ. This is not what we are looking for. For the web, those are tools. Okay, the, what we want to know about is, the, is what has been done with those tools. So it's a very large concept, information warfare, it's as old as war. And if you want to keep in mind those six uh, big dimensions of information warfare, so propaganda is, uh, is one, and it was used by uh, Jules César and, and all these people. Disinformation is when you uh, give an information that is not true, and so you make people, uh, you, you lie to people. Demoralization is more like when you uh, bring in an information that makes people feel that they are losing. Like, we captured 500 of your soldiers, or uh, we destroyed one city, or so people will say, oh my god, if this is true, then, then we are losing, so we are, we are demoralized. Manipulation is also uh, can be manipulation of facts and also manipulation of minds. And you will see that uh, what ISIS is doing is mostly about manipulating the brains of the people. Um, deception is when you uh, try to make some arrangements with the reality. <laughs> you try to uh, say something and it's, uh, about, about a fact and something else happened. So it's, it's like lying, it's like uh, disinformation, but it's, it, it has an, in, an objective behind. You want people to believe a different thing. And denial of information is when you block people from accessing information. So let's say, for instance, DOS attacks, mostly uh, their objective is uh, to, to reach into denial of information. We don't want people to be able to access a website or to access like a thread on a forum or something like that. So uh, it's a very large concept. And it, the family of this is what we call PSYOPs, psychological warfare. And uh, this is the, the big name for, uh, for uh, information warfare operations. Uh, so what we were looking at is, as we are not computer science people and we don't know much about all those technologies of virus, worms, DOS, and those kind of things, we decided to look at the web, just the web. So for us, the web is web servers, web pages, uh, HTTP URLs, I mean, the, the basic stuff. And uh, it's not just the basic stuff, it's also the content. Because sometimes when you look at the technology, virus, and the US, you don't really look at the content. We decided to go on the surface of things, so go uh, on what people see, actually. Uh, this is very, that was said in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, I would say not 60s, but 70s, 80s, 90s in the US, this theory that the networks, and one of those networks called the internet, uh, is a new battlefield. Battlefields are the ground, the space, the, the air, the water, where else? <laughs> space, yes, I said space. We fight in space now. Uh, information warfare is, a, is one part of cyber warfare, which is a bigger name for, uh, for, for the, this kind of warfare. So, uh, I don't know if you have time to see the picture. What will the warrior guard in the future look like? So I can't yeah. read what, what, what is the you do, saying? You do it back here. And uh, this is cyber security on the, on the desk. Can you read? Okay, so you think that this is the super warrior, but actually the super warrior is this guy. 
Yeah, that's a, no. so you yeah. saw the last uh, James Bond. This is what, uh, not the last one, the one before. What this little uh, geek guy behind his uh, his laptop is humiliating James Bond with all these guns and cars and girls. And, you know. ah. So this is uh, this is the this is the thing. So uh, this is one one kind of uh, cyber attack, uh, information warfare attack. It's called uh, web defacement. So web defacement is when you change the content of uh, of a website. Uh, by putting a different page instead of the home page, or you modify the content. So it's just an example of uh, uh, one, one uh, uh, attack. So as the web is the internet's information system, it's the, the surface that people see, actually people where people get information. Uh, is information warfare of the web just uh, a collateral asset? It's like there's a cyber warfare that uses all the technologies, and the web is just one aspect of it. Or is it using the multiplier effect? What we call the multiplier effect is the fact that when you, the web is so well adopted and is so visible compared to other technologies on the internet, it's so visible that uh, it has like a very big effect on media, on knowledge, on people, and on education and, and things like that. So you're using it as a multiplier effect. You're not using it as a real, real tool for attacks. It's just, um, this is why we call it collateral assets. Uh, you launch an attack, and this attack has a multiplier effect because people are talking about the attack on the web, and sometimes you can also launch the attack on the web. So uh, that's, that's one of the research questions that we have. <coughs> this is an example of uh, something that was uh, done by the Syrian government. Uh, so uh, you can no, oh, no, this one, this one is the one by the the anti-government. They had this software called. Um, a bounder fucker, sorry for the word. Bounder is the name of the prince of Qatar or Dubai, or I don't know which one, Dubai, I think. And this is what the, the one on the picture. There's a donkey next to him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, comparing uh, people with animals in the Middle East is just uh, the worst insult ever. Okay, I, I remember once giving a lecture and explaining that we were like, like sheep, people were like sheep, and so the students start to get like, how can you compare us with animals? And it's, like, it's very insulting to compare people with animals. And uh, this is something you could download from the Facebook page of the Syrian opposition. And you decide which uh, uh, website you can flow of information. It's a little application. And it's funny because it was built by the Syrian government, made available, and the hackers from the, the Syrian opposition took it and turned it into exactly the same tool but to attack and flow different websites. So uh, you can find a lot of examples of this. Uh, and so this, this kind of uh, software asks the question, the difference between the attacks that target internet infrastructure and the information warfare tactics and tools. Uh, we make a difference because we didn't want to go into uh, everything that related to the infrastructure. So uh, DDoS and worms and this kind of things. Uh, the, the other problem also, the other research questions was, do we always have to go into asymmetric warfare? You know what is asymmetric warfare? It's that when you have a country fighting another country, this is symmetric warfare. But when you have a country fighting an organization, may it be a resistance or terrorist, or call it whatever you want to call it, the sides you are, uh, is information warfare always based on this kind of asymmetry? It would, uh, you will see that in a different context, it works sometimes very well, but it's not, uh, a, like let's say, a rule that will always take place. Uh, where does the information warfare on the web take place? Is it on the internet? Is it on the web? If we stop the web, do we stop information warfare? And this kind of questions that uh, relates to the nature of the web. But also there's another very impor important thing. And uh, there is a, a professor called Reed that is, uh, I think he's French, but he's uh, in London. And uh, he wrote this book called uh, uh, Cyber Warfare Will Never Take Place. Because... Um, for one reason, well, you, you know what is the BTKP rule? It's called break things and kill people. This is one of the rules of warfare. If you don't kill people or if you don't break things, uh, it's very difficult to call it uh, warfare. And uh, if you think about information warfare, do you think you can break things and kill people? And Reed said, no, because it will never take place. Because uh, breaking things is too expensive for a small organization. And it's too visible for a big one. So let's say if you're the government of, I don't know, the country called um, uh, Moldova, let's invent a country. <laughs> There's a country called Moldova? No. 
What's the, what's the name of the country in Tintin? Silva, Sildavia. Silva, yeah, in Tintin it's called Sildavia. So let's say Sildavia wants to attack another country called, uh, uh, I don't know, X or, or XY or whatever. And uh, uh, thanks to a cyber attack, bring down a dam and flood a complete city and kill millions of people. This would be way too visible. Okay? And if you want to do that, you can do it with a bomb from a plane, which is much cheaper than uh, launching a complete cyber attack to take control of a dam. So it doesn't make any sense to do that by cyber, cyber attacks. On the other hand, if you're a terrorist organization, the, the means to achieve this point are so expensive and so difficult that uh, that's not the kind of attack you're interested in. So the guy, and Thomas Reed, is someone that is criti uh, very criticized, but also is very, his point is very interesting. He said, uh, uh, cyber warfare will never take place because it, it's not interesting for, for the sides. But I don't understand the point. I mean, you can hire someone to hack for you into a dam and maybe mm. make, but make work to function, while placing a bomb requires an infrastructure that, especially, let's say, a terrorist organization just might not have. Yes, but the thing is, it, it, they take like a context of a war between, uh, like a real ongoing war. Like if, there's a, if there was a war, cyber, uh, cyber attacks are not as efficient and they are very expensive compared to a regular uh, military attack like launching a nuclear bomb or this kind of thing. If you want to get like a real advantage on the ground. This is why we call those weapons like cyber warfare and information warfare the weapons of mass annoyance. They're annoying. You get, uh, uh, when you get these kind of things on your computer, it's just annoying. It doesn't kill people or break things. Okay? But it's, it can be very annoying because it, the objective is to deny access to information. So the, the, the impact of uh, information warfare is mostly annoying, not just breaking things and killing people. This is Thomas Reed, I'm just talking. I, sometimes I agree with that because I think, yes, if you think about it, there are other ways to wage war that are cheaper and that have a better impact. And for organizations, for organizations, uh, organizations Let's say you're, you're a terrorist organization and you attack a database somewhere in the US and you steal like, patents and this kind of thing. Selling back this kind of data or information would be very uh, difficult for, uh, for the organization because the states that would actually buy them at some point would be identified. And uh, most of the countries that, which are not technically at war are just doing these little tactics of information warfare, but they don't really want to destroy something from the enemy because it would start a war or it would start like a big conflict under repercussions. So there's like, it's like the nuclear bomb. There's some sort of, a, of an agreement between uh, everyone in cyber attacks. Tomorrow, uh, a regular hacker can hack, uh, say, a transportation system in the US or the financial system in Wall Street or cut the internet down the, in the middle of the Atlantic. But why are they not doing it? Because this would start a war. And this is not what people want, because war is more, much more expensive and much more damageable than just like, a small attack that's... Because there was a virus in the uh, Arania nuclear facilities mm. that you don't, well, people don't know exactly. People also suspect that it was uh, Israel who mm. had the capabilities to do it and uh, the incentives to do it. Mm. And uh, the Stuxnet attack. Yeah. Yeah. The Stuxnet attack, it was a, the, the, the virus was developed by uh, an Israeli company and launched by uh, an agent in Iran. And the thing is, it was slowing down by a few seconds the machines that, the, yeah, the turbines of the, and after some time, it would, this would uh, uh, create like some sort of a small problem and make the uranium that is enriched by those machines uh, not usable anymore. So yes, it's it's my it's annoyance. It's not really something that it's not like bombing the uh, the, the research facility or the, the, the factory, but it really makes like uh, sometimes a, a big difference in time. Or so, I mean, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the information warfare can't be costly. In any case, I mean, it cannot be costly. It is costly. It could be costly to to launch the attack. Building something like Stuxnet took ten years. Okay. But it could be also very costly on the diplomatic uh, effect of things. And now America and China are like exchanging this kind of little attacks. And once uh, the, the, there's this general that is now in North Korea or China, I don't know, 
that is uh, uh, suspected of selling information to the Americans. But there's not like a, it doesn't start a war. You know, it's, it's just nobody wants to, to, to go into a war. So this is the kind of tacti tactics they're using. Because currently, um, like hiring a cyber hacker is like hundred dollars thing. So, hmm? so it's like uh, yeah, but you need a lot of them to actually make something valuable. That's the point. You can launch a small uh, defacement attack. It's nothing, but it's the result is nothing. It's just annoying. It's like a little bite on the on the on the arm. And uh, but some people say that there will not be a cyber conflict, but people say there is cyber warfare all the time. The number of the U.S. attacks on the U.S. on China today is like millions a day. It's like it's huge the number. There's an ongoing cyber warfare, but there's not a cyber war. That's the that's the point of the industry. If I want to submit anyway. So uh, our research questions were: Why would why would organizations or state actually use information warfare, which is as we said a bit complicated and quite costly, to uh, to get advantage on, on the ground. What are the objectives and the strategies behind uh, this kind of, uh, of warfare? Uh, we also wanted to make the connection between the types of attacks, the contents that are, being, uh, are used in the attack, uh, the targets, what kind of uh, uh, the targets are people targeted or uh, media outlets targeted or governments targeted, and the actions. So we wanted to draw like some sort of a, a map connection between uh, strategies, objectives, ways of attacks, types of attacks, contents, uh, to understand why this, is, uh, this, this information warfare makes sense and is going on. This is an example uh, I will talk about that uh, was uh, during the war in Lebanon in 2006. This website is just um, a denunciation website. So you go on this website, it's been made by Israel, it's called All for Lebanon, and you put the name and the place and the phone number of a member of Hezbollah that you know, and you just send information. It's very interesting because who would do that in Lebanon? It's a war between Lebanon and Israel. But in Lebanon, they are supporters of Israel. So they were thinking that maybe those people would actually go online and, and denunciate people. But what is interesting, it looks like a Lebanese website. It has Lebanese colors and everything. It's French and English, but it's uh, an Arabic. But it's definitely made to uh, denounce uh, the tourist that lives next to you. <laughs> And there's a phone number and there's an email. I suggest all Lebanese people in the room not to use this website. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Um, so we also wanted to get interested in the actors uh, because so many people are involved in this information warfare that we don't see really the borders between uh, the groups. So you have uh, the kind of groups like uh, Hezbollah, like Hamas, like Daesh, but you also have Anonymous involved in these kind of things. Armies, the Israeli army, the IDF, is really, really, really savvy on, on this kind of things. But also the Syrian electronic army, which is like an army, but not inside the army. In Israel, uh, most of the companies, the big companies, have resident, permanent uh, computer scientists uh, that spend 90% uh, of their time working for the company and 10% of the time working for the IDF. And uh, so, so this goes into business, and also Facebook and Google are involved in that. When you watch a video of uh, behaving by ISIS on Google, Google should, is involved in a way. Like Google is not a public service, it's a, it's a private company. And indi individuals can sometimes play a role. Sometimes one young hacker somewhere for money or for just for political interest can actually launch its, its own cyber warfare on something and decides that is on this, uh, this camp or the, the other camp. Um, so this is a little bit like what it looks like. I like this drawing. Uh, our research problem was to how to observe information warfare. And this was like a, a really complicated uh, subject of discussion. Because we need to observe what's going on, so the context is very important. We need to identify the attacks, and then we need to measure. Three things that are not very, <laughs> very cool to do when you're a social scientist. And so we took uh, this paper from uh, Giacomello, he's a researcher in Italy, and uh, we, we thought that the methodology that was used was very interesting, learning from the expense of peace research and arms control. And uh, I will show you now what, what is the uh, methodology. So the first part of the job is to uh, observe uh, the context and define the context. So 
to define the context, we need to identify all the official places. A context is a context of a conflict. Okay, you, you will see now that I'll give you four contexts. So the first, the, the, for every context, you need to find out uh, the official website, for instance, uh, the reference sources where all the information comes from uh, in terms of circulation. You need to identify the players at stake, uh, the historical background of the context, uh, the virtual borders. Uh, you have websites for Lebanese people in Paris, you have websites for uh, Jewish community in the US and everything. The strategic assets, the main newspapers, the main uh, radio station, the TV, the, the, the accounts on YouTube, the accounts on Facebook, and the obvious targets, the sites of the Ministry of Defense on the, of the Israel government or the site of uh, the research center of uh, Iranian nuclear uh, facilities and stuff. So you also have to find, uh, to identify the sources where the information about the attacks will come from. And this is also something very complicated and you really have to exactly know your context because you need to find out where, where to look for those attacks. Okay, you can just open the television and here there's been a cyber attack on this website, and when the Harvard website was hacked by the Syrian Electronic Army, it was all over the press and all over the news. But this is one attack, while there were uh, maybe 1,000 attacks the same day. So you have to find uh, specialized websites that uh, start to list all those attacks and identify those attacks. Some forums, because the, the attacker usually likes to advertise what he's been doing, and so you have specialized forums where you find that uh, I'm a Russian or a Czech uh, hacker, and I did this this morning, and so you have to, you have to follow on, the, on, the, on those forums and declarations. Sometimes the, um, the parties in the conflict can make official declarations and claims, especially uh, uh, when in asymmetric warfare you have the small organizations that re really makes it to a, a big, big government or website, then, then, then they advertise about it, they talk about it. As a, it's part of the, of the warfare. You have to identify also incidents and media reports. Uh, sometimes uh, there's, uh, there's an attack on the website, it's, uh, especially for the DOS attacks, where you don't, uh, you don't hear about it. But then you go on the website and you see that the website has been shut down for uh, maintenance. And usually a shut down for maintenance, this kind of incident, is due to a technical attack at, at some point. And sometimes specialized media reports can also help you identify the attacks. And uh, on, the, on the social network and on Twitter, and you have a lot of influencers, uh, gatekeepers, and community talking about these, these attacks all the time. So the, the first part of the job is just to list all these things and do a permanent observation of that. So yes, you can run, um, uh, you can search for hashtags or you can follow accounts on Twitter and look for this kind of information. Uh, so there are many, many ways to do this. Then the second job is to uh, identify the existence of the action. So you have to identify the traces. Because sometimes people talk about an action, but it, you don't know if it really took place or if there's, uh, you can verify exactly what has been going on. And you can use two approaches. First approach is quality. Uh, quality. Uh, you can look for hashtag, you can look for reference somewhere. Uh, or you can do permanent tracking of a special account or uh, a hashtag. So you, it's something that you have to, to look for. And also you can put some indications in, in the distortions in usage. Let's say um, when you extract data on a regular basis, sometimes when you, when you look at hashtag, you see that there's a surge in, in this hashtag at some point. And this hashtag is usually used to describe an attack that has been taking place. So when you have a flat line and then suddenly you have a surge and then suddenly then you have to look for why those surges and why, uh, what kind of inf uh, event do they relate to. And this is a lot of work uh, and uh, you miss a lot. That's the problem of this research is like, if we were like 200 uh, researchers, it would have been much easier, but we're like five people and looking at even one context at a time is very, is very complicated. Uh, then you have to verify that the attacker has the ability uh, to launch this kind of attack. And uh, but, uh, with time, you know that some organizations can do things and some organizations can't do uh, the same kind of things because they don't have the, the ability to do that. And also, of course, if you're lucky, you can sometimes observe or report uh, the damage done. Like let's say when you have a, sc a screenshot of a, w a website that's been defaced, or if you have a copy of a video of Daesh, then you have a proof. 
that, like the existence and identification is validated by the proof, the, 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 the image that you have, or video that you have. But sometimes it's very difficult because, especially for the Israeli websites, the, I would say one minute after the attack, the, the website comes back online. So, uh, so it can be very difficult sometimes just to have a visual proof of the, of the attack. When it's uh, an email that's been sent for uh, disinformation or for uh, the website that we saw that on denunciation, of course, it's, uh, it's much easier because it's something that lasts longer and you have a copy of it. Then, the third part, once you have your table, you put the date, you put the name of the attack, that you give a name to the attack, then you put the target, you put the attacker, you put the kind of damage that's been done, you put the, the sources, the reference, and everything. Then you have to so that the descriptors, the type of attack, damage, tragic objective, you have to code according to the objectives, and you can regroup according to the six dimensions that I gave at the beginning, what is disinformation, what is uh, denial of information, what is uh, defacement, and these kind of things. And of course, you can do tables, graphs. Uh, in French, we say camembert, you know, the, the pies. <laughs> I don't know why you call it camembert in French. Uh, and you can do the analytics, and you can do these kind of things. Uh, so this is for the methodology. Now I'll show you the context. The first context that we work on was the 2006 war in Lebanon. So uh, it's, uh, it's a war that lasted thir uh, 30 days. And it was uh, completely asymmetric because Hezbollah is not uh, the state of Lebanon. It's, uh, uh, if you're Lebanese, you call it resistance. If you're Israeli, you call it tourist. Uh, organization that uh, was, you know, it started as a, there were soldiers passing by the border, and then the Hezbollah came, and they took them into Lebanon, and then Israel decided a war to uh, bring them back. But they were killed in the operation, so when they brought them back, they were already dead. So it's, it's the most stupid war ever. <laughs> uh, but they got the bodies back, and in exchange of the bodies, Lebanon came back uh, 25 years in history <laughs> because of the destructions and uh, 1,500 people killed. And uh, so it was completely asymmetric because it was not between Lebanon and Israel, it was between Israel and an organization in Lebanon. But this was 2006, so it was just at the beginning of Facebook and this kind of thing. So it was pretty amateur and this kind of uh, non-prepared attack. So uh, this is one example. The Hezbollah website has been turned into uh, Hebrew. And uh, so this is so insulting for <laughs> Hezbollah people to have their website turned into Hebrew. Uh, but at the time, it was... Um, Israel and also some organizations, because uh, Hezbollah is linked to Iran, that is linked to Hamas and all these kind of uh, organizations, they, they, it was the time where they started to, to think about the power of information warfare. And uh, it was also the first time that we, we saw that there was like an attack, then a counterattack, then a counterattack, then a counterattack. It was, it was really going on. It was not like a few actions. It was really going on. There was something going on. And we had a chance to capture a few of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, information available. In this context, we found, I will give you four examples of the types of attacks we found. There was this uh, megaphone software, which is a software that allows uh, the Jewish community in the world to know about uh, what is going on in this world. So it's mostly uh, propaganda and disinformation about, uh, uh, about what's going on. Uh, same thing, uh, Israel did a lot of uh, web pages defacement and vice versa, but it's way more difficult for uh, Hezbollah to change something on the website in Israel rather than to, to do it on, uh, on the other way. Uh, uh, Israel used a lot of satellite photos from uh, Google Earth uh, to uh, uh, transform some of the attacks into meaningful attacks. Let's say Lebanon has not so many targets, so many uh, strategic targets. We don't have nuclear plants, we don't have uh, planes, we don't have uh, boats, uh, army boats or planes or army, army planes. So there was nothing to destroy. And they had to use the weapons that they bought from the, uh, for, for 30 days. So uh, they were bombing stuff like a milk factory, uh, an aluminium factory. And so they were modifying the satellite photos on Facebook and sending them to the, to the other world to say, oh, look, uh, there they, they were cannons and bombs in this building and, uh, you know, they were fighting, firing at us. But it was obvious on some of the pictures that we, uh, we found out that the pictures had been manipulated on, uh, on Google uh, Earth. And uh, as you, I, saw, I showed you the All for Lebanon website. 
So the first context, and we had a chance to present it here in problems in 2011, was just, uh, I would say, the, the, the first skirmishes of what will become a much global and much more complicated uh, aspect of, uh, of the world. At the time, there was no official strategy by the Israeli government. A lot of innovation. We are trying to use different kinds of, uh, of uh, attacks. Lots of uh, individual initiatives. I even have a student in my, in my classroom who was a hacker in the Hezbollah. And he was very proud of what he did. And he did the presentation at the, in September after the war at the university. And, uh, but he was not related to Hezbollah. He was just a supporter. And it had a lot of uh, limited impact. It wasn't big. It was uh, just a little annoyances. But a lot of symbolism. So meaning like, wow, we can actually film the destruction of a boat uh, by uh, of Israeli boat by the by the Hezbollah, and then put it on YouTube. And this was like, wow, super cool at the time. But uh, it didn't go far, and the war was very short in time. But there was a lot of exercise done at the at the time. The second context that we uh, we, we went into is uh, Syria from January 2011 to. Uh, July 2011, so six months, where the situation in Syria turned from protests down the streets to into a civil war, into a government killing its people and people um, fighting against the government. So uh, that's the first case in history of information warfare in a civil war. There was the, there was there's no other example of this before, and uh, the paper that we presented at the conference was called "The Web Between Liberation and Repression" because. This was following uh, the Egyptian revolution and the Tunisian revolution that actually succeeded at the time in hosting the, the former dictator and bringing, I mean, for Egypt, it's hard to say democratic government, but uh, bring someone else, let's say. <laughs> I didn't say someone worse, but I said someone else. And then the, the, the one before <laughs> came back with another general and everything. But uh, at the time, there was this belief that social media helped change the situation and it's true, they helped, it helped, but uh, not in the way that we thought. The, what we show about the, the context of Syria is uh, the fact that, and this is also something that Morozov said in the, in the net disillusion, is the web and the social media is much, much more uh, helpful for government to run a repression, and this is something also we saw in the Iranian, I don't know if you remember, the Twitter revol Green Revolution in Iran. Uh, most of the people who went to Twitter to denounce the Iranian government had the same fate as uh, what happened in Syria, is uh, they turned the social media into a spying system. And uh, Facebook was uh, not allowed in Syria before uh, 2011. It was impossible to go on Twitter, impossible to go on Facebook, and impossible to go on Wikipedia. And at the time, Syria was close to, uh, is still close to Iran, and Iran has a very, uh, had a very good experience with the, uh, the Twitter revolution, the Green Revolution. They were creating what they call honeypots. And a honeypot on the web is a place uh, to catch people. So you create this, the official revolution page, and then everybody likes the page, you know, these kind of things. Because people believe that, wow, we are safe, we're on Facebook. Facebook doesn't belong to the Syrian government or to the Iranian government. And actually, the problem is like they were they were using it as a as a way to catch people. So, in in uh, January 2011, what did the Syrian regime? They opened up the internet to all the websites. So suddenly, you could create an account on Facebook. You can you could use Twitter and you could modify things on Wikipedia and uh, and all the Syrians said, "Wow, this this has been working in Egypt. So we're, we're going to do the same." But Helped by uh, many advisors from Iran and also from uh, Russia, the, the Syrian government was very, very intelligent during uh, creating those honeypots and identifying people. And we say that the fake accounts they created on the, on the social media in these six months lead to 1,200 uh, arrests of uh, militants and people uh, down the street who were actually using those social media to uh, tell the world about the revolution in Syria. And now if you think, I don't know what your opinion was going on in Syria, but the fact that at the time the revolution in Syria was a people revolution against that government, now it had turned into uh, Islamic groups against uh, a poor government of, uh, uh, that wants to, to, to fight against uh, Islamic terrorism. But uh, at the time it was a popular revolution against the regime. 
but they turn this into something else because of this information warfare means that, that, that they have. Uh, and something also that the, you have to know that Bashar Assad was the president of the Syrian Computer Association. He's a, he's a geek, okay? Mm. He's a real geek. And uh, in this computer association, a lot of those students were supporting the regime, and they created the Syrian Electronic Army, which is the first example in history of an electronic army officially uh, recognized by the head of state of its country. And the Syrian Electronic Army uh, launched more than 122 defacement attacks the first year. Yes? Yeah. There's a word Syrian missing, I think, yeah? So the first official Syrian electronic army. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. But it's, no, it's, uh, it's also, uh, if you think about it, it's, it's one of the first official... Ah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. The uh, first of the abbreviation. It's definitely the first one in Syria, but uh, I don't have any other example of, a, of an official electronic army fighting in a conflict ah, okay. that has been recognized uh, uh, officially, like in a TV, a TV uh, presentation, by the leader of the country, as being because it's not an official army from the army. It's a group of hackers. They call themselves the Syrian Electronic Army, but they were mostly friends and, and students from the national universities in Damascus and members of this uh, computer association that uh, Bashar was uh, heading. Um, uh, we, we can discuss the, 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 the situation. I, I just want to finish the, the context. Uh, in the third context, the context of uh, the Gaza war that took place also, I think, in September 2012, um, for the first time, we, we had, before the war, before the war started, uh, a complete written strategy by the Israeli Defense Forces uh, to prepare for the information warfare. So, Following 2006, and following what was going on in the Arab Spring and everything, the Israeli Defense Forces uh, started to organize seminars and identify <coughs> people and create like a real official military strategy to fight the information warfare. And uh, this example, it's uh, the, uh, the assassination of Ahmad Jabri. Ahmad Jabri was uh, a leader of the Hamas military wing. And what Israel did, instead of just killing him like they usually do, they organized a complete filming and uh, social media type, YouTube, YouTube style uh, movie about the assassination of Ahmed Jabril. And once the, uh, the assassination was filmed live, you could watch it live on the, on the, on, on the, on the internet. And, but you, can, you could also go to YouTube and see they were like interviewing the, um, the soldiers before the attack. Then there was the film by a drone. Like a, it looked like an American movie, a war movie, and you could see the, the car exploding, and you can see people down the street, and it was a complete movie that was prepared exactly to promote the assassination of Ahmed Jabri, uh, like, like, a, like a movie uh, trailer. And the movie trailer was just to announce the war that was coming uh, after the invasion of the Gaza Strip and uh, the war that came with it. So it was very interesting, because it was very well done. It was planned before. And it, 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 it used a lot of very good technology to, to do that. Uh, also in this context, we saw the emergence of new actors, like the cyber fighters, but on the other side, not just the army. And also for the first time, Anonymous uh, got into the game and started to, uh, to denounce the war crimes and the bombings uh, in, in Gaza. Um, uh, the Israeli army had a, a big strategy called Hasbara, Okay, Hasbara is the, the, the information to the Jewish community, and it's like informing the Jewish all over the world, the Jews all over the world. And the, the objective of this strategy, that was pretty up everywhere on the web, was to legitimize uh, a war that was very difficult to legitimize. Okay, it's very difficult for Israel to, the images are very difficult for them. You know, it's, if, if you look at what's going on in Gaza, you have a very small place, as big as Koblenz, that is bombed by millions of tanks and planes and so it's even if the reason why this, this war is legitimate for Israel the images of this war are very difficult to uh, to support and to create international support every time you see destruction of the house in Gaza the whole world is looking on television and saying oh, wow I mean poor people this is Haram in Arabic poor people these days and it's difficult for Israel to, to justify the actions because of the images so what they decided to do is to control the images and this is classic in warfare. Napoleon was very good at this. He would come back and tell his generals like, the, how the battle was planned and 
when everybody was like laying on the ground in blood and mud and everything. So uh, uh, also we found out that to, to to go against the kind of uh, of control of image, control, legitimization by image, uh, the emergence of the citizen journalism at the time. So people were on the ground filming and trying to go against the official propaganda of the Israeli state. So, uh, so this was very interesting because for the first time things w went into more professional uh, content and professional, you know, Israelis are very savvy in, with technologies and it really looked very good at the time and uh, I think this is why they could go on with the war for so long. And the final context, context number four, uh, we started to get interested after a presentation I made at uh, uh, Bloomington on uh, the, the, this concept of mass annoyance, like we, we're annoyed all the time. And I ended up my presentation <laughs> saying, the next big thing is ISIS. You will see ISIS will be the next big, big player on the information warfare. And it's exactly what happened. Uh, ISIS started to use all the examples from the past. I don't know if they, if they had our papers <laughs> in hand, but uh, they, they took every lesson, they learned every lesson well from every context that was in the past, especially the, the one about Gaza, how the Israelis uh, took control of the, of the whole imagery of the war by creating a, a, a worldwide strategy of communication on the web, by bringing films, videos, uh, Twitter accounts, uh, Facebook pages, and then you can go into the discussion of all the, the responsibility of all these platforms in, in providing support for these people. But, uh, the thing is, all those images and videos uh, went all over the web, the web, and we decided to look into every kind of content that uh, ISIS was providing for the web. I uh, decided to hide these pictures because it's not nice. I put flowers instead. So, uh, I don't know if you prefer this one. <laughs> okay, so what we did, we took uh, one year of ISIS communication, and we decided to look for what is the strategy, because this is just not just content for the web or uh, disinformation. It's a complete communication strategy. And behind ISIS, you have uh, communication uh, people from different countries. You even have like a French company that was providing support for uh, transferring images and uploading the images on the, uh, on the platforms. So what we found out on ISIS is uh, the strategy is divided in three big, uh, big objectives. The first objective is also, of course, to build the audience and the support of the actions. You know, it's difficult because in the context of terrorist groups, you have a lot of people. You have Al-Qaeda, you have, um, what's the name of uh, Al-Nusra, you have uh, Daesh, you have a lot of people on the ground. So you have to build and market what they call the caliphate, the fact that they are the ones. To do this, they created uh, special content, they created uh, people, Personas, uh, the the super fighter that uh, went in the battle in Fallujah, or uh, this this super girl from France who turned into a suicide bomber, and despite that she has uh, five kids to, uh, and then she's turned into a hero. And this kind of language all the time, the the words they are using, the kufra, this kind of uh, of vocabulary they're building. This is all a strategy. This is all made by communication strategists from all over the world who went and get paid and work for these people to build this, uh, this kind of imagery. So the first one was to, the first objective was to build audience and support from over the world. And now you know that many of the kids from England, from Germany, from France, who went to fight jihad in Iraq and Syria, actually, most of them did it through the web. They learned about ISIS on the web, they learned about the language, they learned about the, the images, they, they, they dreamt about the, uh, the, 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 I would say the, the I, I don't know how to call this, but there's some kind of an adventure. Uh, most of the people living in France uh, that went to fight jihad in Syria said they had boring lives, and when they watched the videos of ISIS online, then they could find like this guy had like such an exciting life. They're fighting and they have like plenty of women around them, and it's like they make lots of money because they attack banks. And so they were building on this through uh, the, their international support, and this support translated into real people coming and fighting for them. So this, this is one of the big, biggest debates today on the web, I think. Uh, how can we block this kind of content, and how can we stop it from reaching our kids? But this is a different uh, research. But 
This is definitely a big, a big problem. And they were very, very good at doing this. They had this website called Al Hayat, it was the website of the official propaganda. And you can see all the videos, the beheadings, the, the, the killings, the battles. And they, went, they were even, and this is something that we found out through the live tweeting they were doing, they were framing the, the military action on the ground by Twitter. So uh, to, to, to attack a target, some of the, of the military of ISIS were using special hashtags and live tweeting the positions and live tweeting, uh, okay, we destroyed that car, now you can move. And we found some of the tweets in Arabic, of course, uh, explaining exactly how the, the, the mission was going on the ground in real time. So this is, of course, uh, for marketing and for building audience, but also to organize the communication inside the, the, the military actions. And this was a bit scary because they're using Twitter. And many times and I asked the question to one guy in Twitter uh, at the World Wide Web Conference in Montreal. And I was like, can't you stop this? Can't, when you see these hashtags, they say, yes, but we need like a day or two to find out about the hashtag. Be sure that it's a real ISIS hashtag and then remove it. Yesterday, we were doing the exercise with, uh, with you and the other people and uh, trying to find out the official hashtags of ISIS or the official accounts. It's very difficult because Twitter is doing a good job at removing them. But still, uh, now they have bots, and bots create automatically, they back up the, the content, and they upload the content again. So Twitter is, is almost um, inefficient to, uh, to fight these kind of things. And of course, as I said, the market, uh, marketing of the caliphate, this is internal language turned to the people, of, of their own people. And this is interesting because this didn't exist before. Now they are talking to the people on the ground. They are they're not talking to the West or uh, trying to uh, to, to make uh, people from Israel or from other countries afraid. They are talking to their own people and they're telling them, we are the ones, we are the caliphates. And this is very interesting because five years ago, it was impossible to upload a video from the ground in, in the Middle East. The connections and the, the, the availability of technology. But today, every kid in the city uh, owned by ISIS or by uh, in Syria, Iraq, has a cell phone, has a 4G connection, has a Twitter and Facebook and a YouTube account. And all these things that like, really did change the game on the ground. So uh, this is what we found. Uh, so uh, a few numbers, and I don't want to go into too much numbers, but uh, we studied those four contexts in six years. We, we have a list of around 2,500 attacks. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's grouped by uh, the six dimensions that I mentioned. And we, we analyzed 67 different sources from websites to forums to uh, data sets and, and things like that. So uh, if, you, if you look at the groups, it's, uh, this is how we actually looked at the big strategies. You know, in the first, in the first uh, context in Lebanon, the deception was uh, the main tool because it's the easiest one. Uh, in Syria, manipulation and propaganda were pretty big. Deception also. In Gaza, Propaganda and denial of information was, uh, was also in, uh, very high with this information. And with ISIS, you have propaganda, which is mainly the, 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 the reason. ISIS, they don't have to say we are not doing it. ISIS, they just have to say we are doing it, which is a new, a new approach in terms of communication. This is the kind of table that we have. So we have the date. Uh, sometimes we have or not the, the author. Uh, we get the target. This is taken from Akmageddon, which is a website uh, that is very good at identifying uh, one of the 67 sources that we have. So they, they describe the type of attacks and the type, uh, the name of the technical attack, the target category, the attack category, the country that is uh, targeted. So we have to extract all the data from those tables just to keep on the Middle East. Okay. And uh, so this is the kind of information. If you barbecue the new has been attacked. I don't know why they attacked barbecue. Uh, this is also the kind of information that we got uh, by IP address. Okay, this is opennet.org that, that gives you access to the data sets. And uh, this is for the Syrian Electronic Army. So we found out that uh, during this um, May, June 2011, uh, Netherlands was mainly the target of the Syrian Electronic Army, uh, including Israel also. Israel websites are, are, are targeted by this, and some other countries like Italy and France and the United Kingdom. So you see all those IP addresses you can find. Okay, so as a conclusion, because I think I've been <laughs> way too long, anyway. but um, I would say as a team of, as a small team of social science and political science researchers, 
We just did scratch the surface of things. And Stefan can, can uh, confirm that at every web science conference, I've been calling for help and uh, I've been calling for computer scientists to actually look into this, into this problem, into these data sets, and get, uh, help us get, get, to get more information, to get more accuracy on the attacks, to identify other types of attacks, because uh, on the web it's interesting, but behind, behind the web, under the web, there's a lot of going on also that we don't understand. And uh, this is a very complex research because it involves a lot of uh, knowledge of the context. It's exploratory because you have to look for information all the time and you have to change your sources all the time. Uh, the understanding is, is essential. You have few sources. The references are very difficult to evaluate because there's a lot of propaganda going on in the propaganda of the information warfare. And um, it's hard to get first-hand information. First of all, because you, it's very difficult to talk to actors, I, except for the student that, of mine that was uh, very proud of his defacement attack uh, during the, the war in 2006. I never had the chance to talk to a, a CNN electronic army member, especially because we are Lebanese uh, research center, so we are part of the, of the problem. And uh, uh, actions and intentions is also very difficult. I, I had the chance to talk to someone from the French DGSE, which is like the CIA of France, and um, they just don't want to talk about it. They just don't. They answer a few questions on why you do this and do that, but they don't really get into uh, into the real intentions and actions that they 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 they're launching. And uh, also, there's a call for creation of new tools to observe this kind of things because this is ongoing. Okay, this is ongoing and it's changing. It's evolving all the time. And then I go back to the manifesto web science that says that the web is a uh, uh, is a fixed thing that is also moving or transforming all the time. It's fixed at the moment where you look at it, but it's, it's always transforming, and the technology is behind it always transforming. <coughs> so, uh, so, yes, this is, uh, this is most of it. Uh, you can check our blog, and you can also uh, send me emails and questions if you have. But uh, that, then I renew my call for help if anyone's interested in working on this. And, uh, we have a lot of data that we can give away, and also we need uh, people to help us gather more data so uh, we can go on this. Voila. I think we have, we have time for questions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the uh, interesting talk. Um, so I know from the psychology, it's possible to focus on yeah, negative things or positive things. So if you have positive psychology, for example, that would be yeah, a, a possible approach to this topic you mentioned to uh, try, uh, that's a, a, suge a suggestion I'm doing now, um, if you have uh, things like virtual reality for maybe Israel and Palestine or for the, yeah, for the people there in conflict, so they could have their own yeah, unlimited space in virtual reality and could do everything what they want, and there's no conflict anymore, and it's not necessary to fight against each other, other because you yeah, can live in your virtual reality or in the yeah, cyberspace or whatever to yeah, do what you want and to yeah, have a building where you want and so on. All the conflicts. Um, is this a yeah, possibility for you? And uh, it's, a, it's a suggestion. So, what do you uh, think that's maybe a good idea? You, you know, in 2006, when Israel destroyed Lebanon, they had no, as I said, they had no targets, they had nothing to do. So they invented, uh, if you want, a virtual country called Lebanon, which is supposed to be a super dangerous country and that needs to be destroyed. So they're already building their own virtual world in terms of by, by working on the, the logics of uh, deciding who's good and bad and deciding and creating the, the content that helps this kind of, uh, of virtual perception. Or, uh, it's something that, that I thought would actually go the way you're saying. Like at some point, people will start fighting in the cyberspace, and uh, then the BKTP rule will not exist anymore. We can just organize a big, um, um, what's the game? Like, uh, you know this game where you fight uh, weapons? Um, this video game, like, uh, yes, this kind of thing. That is another one that is uh, Call of Duty. Call of Duty. <laughs> Call of Duty. I'm thinking about Call of Duty. Like organizing a Call of Duty match between Hezbollah and Israel and fix the problem for good and once and for good. 
but the problem it goes the other way around. It, it went the other way around. Instead of virtualizing the conflicts, it's bringing the conflicts down to the people. And uh, if, if the conflict in, in Syria and Iraq with ISIS is so, such a big problem now, it's because the web has brought the images of the war, those behaviors, those images of, like, very well done images, to the minds of the people in the neighborhoods of Liverpool and Paris and uh, Marseille. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that's the problem. I, I thought it would go virtual. I thought it would go into something like we can look at and think, oh, wow, they attacked this website. And this one has been turned into Hebrew. And this one is turned into Arabic. And this would have been so much fun and uh, no one heard. But the problem is going the other way around. It's going more and more into our everyday lives. Uh, did you ever see a behaving video before ISIS? You never had a chance, but ISIS was so good at doing this that every television, uh, even BBC and France 2 and this kind, had at some point some interest in, in providing support to those videos and showing them to the public. And the, 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 the other question and behind this is, uh, where are YouTube and Facebook and Google and Facebook? And Facebook? What is their position? I talked to someone from YouTube. And he was, a, he was a bit cynical. He said, hey, don't worry. We leave the video for 20 minutes. We make enough money uh, uh, with advertising on this video uh, that we can hire five people for a year, and then we remove the video. <laughs> because when you go on YouTube to watch behaving video, you have advertising on the side, and they make like five thousand dollars in a minute. So. <laughs> and the guy was very cynical, but he was cynical and making fun of me. But I think that's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth. Yes, you say? Um, so yesterday we were talking about the Barbra Streisand effects and how like the attempts to to like remove information from the web have actually like made them more visible on the web, and uh, it made me think of um, the media blackouts on Twitter and whatnot um, through ISIS just this past year, and I was wondering if um, that was in thinking about that if that was like a strategy or if that was more of just like an, a, another social force that came in and created this Barbra Streisand effect. Uh, that's, that's a bit of the problem. Sometimes you give the intention, and this is one of the, of the bias of our study, is sometimes you give the intention to something that is more than a casualty, a casualty uh, uh, um, an externality of the, of the problem. And this is where science can be very useful. Because identifying, I would say, the intention takes a lot of understanding the technical context. And uh, this is maybe something that we are very weak at, is to understand the technical context. Because uh, computer science can explain a little bit of uh, what can be done, and why it's been done, and how it's been done, instead of uh, looking at things and, start and trying to understand uh, in, in the future, or uh, after the, the after effect of things. So, it's a good question because it's very difficult to answer. Yep. Of course, we, we, we look at the we look at the patterns, and we look at the you know everybody's doing uh, what has been previously done and improving it, and so we have families, the six families of things that we the contents that we found out. So uh, no one is reinventing the wheel every time in every conflict. What has been done in a previous conflict can be adapted to, and the the targets and the objectives are the same. But we use we use a. Uh, diplomacy, international relations. This is why we use this uh, arm control methodology because it's very close to that. The, the, uh, this uh, uh, identify, uh, verify, and classify approach. Like weapons, you know the problem with the Iraq war? It's like, um, what was the name of this uh, general of the American army? Went to the UN with one um, sample of uh, nuclear weapon, uh, um, chemical weapon. And he said, look, uh, Saddam Hussein has uh, chemical weapons. He brought this little sample in the United Nations. 
and everybody was like, okay, let's uh, let's uh, destroy Saddam Hussein. And the problem is like uh, for arm control, and you have to verify on the ground. So you have inspectors going and talking to people and trying to find out traces. So they use chemical approach to identify, like to smell if there are like chemical weapons. But they also ask people, uh, do you know how to this kind of thing? So uh, to verify also the technology is interesting. Uh, when when you have a defacement of a website and it's it's called by uh, it's it's um, the claim is made by a small organization then you ask yourself, is this small organization capable, has the capability to do it? Or is, it, is that someone behind? And uh, this is also something we need to ask about cyber warfare, is who's behind it? And I think I'm not against Russia or the United States or China, but those three have like a lot. And many, many private companies are selling technology and uh, selling people, uh, competences. This is why we, we used web science, because web science gave us the, the, quantita the quantitative approach. So we used many papers that we found very interesting in the context of what we do. And then we used the, uh, the, the, the extra mile of, social, of web science, which is the social approach, uh, trying to understand the people, the intentions, the context, the strategy, and uh, not just keep with the, the data. Yes? Yeah. Um, is there maybe a chance for the web science to, yeah, to make uh, the people in the conflict aware of the fact that around, well, in the rest of the world, everyone thinks, why, um, yeah, why are you fighting and why, why is there a problem? So if you, yeah, give the information, maybe there are, I don't know, one million or five million people involved in this conflict, but the rest of the world, yeah, um, seven billion people are there. Yeah. Uh, you think, well, it's a little bit, yeah. And we, we can't really understand why you are so angry about all the things. If you provide this information via web science, or web, yeah, web, web science uh, I think that would be maybe a change in the conscious of the mm. people they have the conflict. Um, you, you know, we have this uh, group, the Web Science Education Group uh, in the Web Science Community, where we discuss how to, to explain this phenomenon to, let's say, in, in schools or universities so people can understand the, the problem and maybe uh, get protected. Because what's behind this study is also my intention to raise awareness on these things and make people less vulnerable to uh, the, the, the information warfare. Because, because what happened in 2006 in Lebanon, I saw people are saying like, uh, oh yes, uh, we, the, the Hezbollah actually sunk uh, 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 an airplane carrier in the middle of the sea. Because the, it was on the website, the video, where you could see a torpedo going from uh, into the sea and there was this carrier that would explode and you can hear people shouting and all our blood and this kind of thing. But everybody saw that this video that went completely viral in Lebanon uh, was a fake. It was, uh, it was uh, actually uh, the American army using, um, trying to, to test top new torpedoes on old boats. And they do this sometimes in, the, in some places. They have like those old boats. They don't want to use them anymore, so they use them to test their weapons on it. So they use this little video. They added the sound of people shouting and shouting Allah Akbar and everything. And they put this on television, saying like, look, Hezbollah has sunk a uh, airplane uh, carrier. But it, it wasn't true. But I would say out of the 4 million people in Lebanon, 3 million people believe it was true. Because nobody is, is prepared against these kind of things. And uh, the young people in the, in the banlieue in France, in the neighborhoods of Paris, who look at the videos of ISIS, they believe that this video is completely true. And that what they say and what they show in the videos is the exact truth. I mean, then we go into the problem of what is true and what is not true, and what is reality and what is not reality. But I don't want to go into that. I think the, 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 the point of this kind of, uh, of thing is to, is to raise awareness and protect the people against uh, this kind of weapons because we are talking about weapons. When you watch a video and then you go from your house in, in, in uh, France or England and you travel all across Europe, you pay $2,000 to pass the border of Syria and you go into a car with a bomb attached to you and you, and you blow up yourself, then, then you realize, like, okay, this little video, video and this, this all this talking, talking by people on Twitter, and you know they're using this. Um, what is this software? Uh, all the, the, the tourists are using uh, the name. It's it's uh, it looks like Snapchat and uh, WhatsApp. It's called it's Russian. Um, Telegram. Telegram. Thank you. 
So if you go on Telegram and you, you can follow all this uh, chit chat about uh, how to go to Syria, how to make a bomb, how to do this. And this is in, in the eyes of the people, of the kids, every kid can go on Telegram, open an account, and join the discussion. And uh, if you don't protect people against this, then people will turn into weapons. And they will go into a bar in Orlando, or they will go into a, a concert, a rock concert in Paris, or they will go into, I don't know what's the, the next city. Yesterday was an attack in Bangladesh. Or, and so, so, yes, we're talking about uh, protecting people from weapons. From the, those, these are weapons. This is why we're talking about information warfare. It's a warfare that's going on. But it's with the web. So the problem is the web a weapon. The, the web is used to spread weapons. In your previous slide, you were showing some IP addresses from yes. the country. Uh, is it relevant today to show IP addresses? This, this was 2011. Maybe at the time, uh, VPNs and stuff like that. But no, I know that, for instance, Syria, we forgot about the IP address long time ago because most of the Syrian people are using VPNs. So, uh, so yes. And this is how I watch Game of Thrones on Netflix in Lebanon. <laughs> no, now I download from Thailand. No, but it's true, it's true. And this is also a problem that we have. The technology are changing. And uh, you know there's this what we call the dark web, this, this uh, 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 tour networks and these kind of things. It's the, the terrorists are all over the place. But it's less and less because now the police from the world have understood that they can create only parts. And especially because there's a link between criminality and, and, and uh, cyber warfare uh, in Syria, some of the most violent uh, content that is produced on the ground goes into the snuff movie industries in the US. So they kill and rape women in villages in Syria, and the videos are, are available on some snuff movie platforms on the toll networks. And so they make money through the, 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 the selling the videos to those platforms, and the platforms you pay with bitcoins, bitcoins go into the money laundry drug <laughs> system and goes back to terrorism. So I, I always tell my students, please stop downloading Game of Thrones from Torrents, you're helping tourists. That makes a point. <laughs> but you can use Netflix for the VPN, that's okay. Other question? Yep. So I think, uh, so my question is a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, different way of the question. So basically you're looking at the phenomena in a context. Mm. But I, I think that in a social science context, you can contribute to the theories. Mm -hmm. So what kind of insight that you can give you the conventional theories or you can like, create new theories you know, looking at the you know, big phenomena? Uh, when, I, when I put at the end here that we, we, we first need to create new tools, uh, I meant uh, technical tools but also a social approach because things are changing at the speed of light. And Bernard said that the web is evolving faster than our ability to observe it. Both, both ways, ways, both on, on the quantitative and the qualitative approach. approach. So, uh, in, in terms, terms of uh, social, social science, I would say that what we, we got from the manifesto from web science, all this approach by uh, uh, a socio-constitution of technology and society, uh, are still relevant in a way. Like, because there are big frameworks to understand the impact of something on people and the people changing the rules of usage, and so I talk about Facebook, or these kind of things. But, uh, it's, you're really right, it would take a very good social scientist, a, a major one, to actually look at this kind of phenomenon and define the new rules of this. Uh, because Latour, is, I would say, is the last one who actually brought something relevant in terms of analyzing society and technology. But Latour is very, um, is very hard and is very difficult to apply to certain contexts. And I would say Latour is a bit like old school in a way. We, we would need new, uh, new so, uh, sociology tools to, uh, to analyze this, but it's very difficult, it's very complicated. Like a lot of people using you know, like collect, collect the action you know, as a you know, kind of, you know, foundation to analyze you know, other strange you know, movements and so on. But it never, it never really went uh, that far and that good. And um, most of, this, of, of the people who went into analyzing this uh, community group network of uh, of uh, social impact of this kind of organization, virtual networks and virtual communities, I failed explaining what happened. They went all wrong. 
Yesterday I was talking uh, about my project on Yugoslavia in 1991 where I ended up saying like Yugoslavia would be the, the, the future model country of the future and uh, Yugoslavia is the exact model that Europe should follow and after three months the war started in Yugoslavia. So, you know, sometimes the sociology and this kind of building on, on events and things to look uh, on the larger scale is very different in a short time. It's very, very different in a short time. You, it really takes long. It's going to take so the, you're kind of suggesting we need to have a short-term, like specific theory support. But, but, but this is why sociology failed at some point at explaining the digital transformation. And this is why we turn to social, to web science and this kind of interdisciplinary approach. And this is what happened to us. Uh, in 2005, I was writing an article about uh, how uh, blogs were changing the, the society in Egypt. And, uh, and then I was completely uh, late. Uh, with, with, we know you were, you were going down the street and asking people, uh, why do you make a blog? And, this kind of methodology of social science from the 60s is, is not relevant anymore. It's, it's too slow. It's too slow. This is why we need more computer science. But we need the computer scientists not to stop at the numbers. We need the computer scientists to help us go the extra mile. This is why your science is interesting. And uh, there's a very good example of this is the health web science uh, uh, part that was developed uh, by um, people from Scotland and people from England. And explaining how uh, the web transformed medicine and health and then uh, go into the, the big numbers, and then go into uh, some policy changes for uh, health systems, the NHS, for instance. This is really like uh, as an impact. OK, I think that's I think I'm done. Then let's we close, we run kind of a bit over, but I think it's just like a, yes, it's very worthwhile to do so. And uh, so let's have still a break of 20 minutes, and uh, reconvene at uh, 10 past 11 for Maria's lecture. Yeah, thank you very much.